a sailor, an Englishman, and my first name is Frank. I'm quite an ordinary sort of individual, all we sailors are. We have our job to do and we do it. You can see me or my mates anywhere in the whole world. You can find us in Joe Beef Saloon in Montreal, or you can find us dancing in the Trocadero in Brisbane, or you can find us getting slightly kettled in Jack Dempsey's bar in New York. We don't wear any uniform. We wear a small silver badge. Well, a long time ago I had three friends, three shipmates, three schoolmates. In 1938, we came back and we decided that as we were all great friends, we'd have a holiday ashore. We had a marvelous time. We were happy and we were sunburned, and Charlie had his wife. And I always look back on that as a sort of calm before the storm, of this storm. You see, to digress for one moment, Charlie and I were very great friends, and we both fell in love with the same girl. Well, she was a very, very wise girl. She chose the infinitely better men. She chose Charlie. Okay, I came to their wedding. I was Charlie's best man. We had a marvelous time, and they were both happy. Of those four men, I sit here now with a funny little grotesque stump where a perfectly good white foot used to be. Billy was blown to hell on a minesweeper. George went down with a courageous. Let me tell you what happened to Charlie. Charlie was on my ship, and we signed on, and he was very, very unhappy when we had to push off. We went out in convoy, and we faced the dive bombers, and we faced the submarines. And later, the convoy sort of broke up, and we went our various ways. We settled down to the ordinary routine life of the ship at sea. And one night, 800 miles from land, I was on watch on the gun at half past six, and it was pitch dark on a tropical night. Suddenly there was a shot and a bang, and into the air they shot an enormous great yellow flare. I turned around and made one wild dash for the gun, and as I got to the gun, suddenly an absolute holocaust of shells burst around us. They were firing on the starboard beam, complete broadsides. Six 11-inch guns and eight 5.9-inch guns. Quick up to the gun, open the breech, ram the shell, put the charge in, put the tube in, close the oven door, run to the trainer, train around quick, Quick, crash the shells are banging into us. Round she's trained, the lights are there. Try and get on that third line. Duck under the metal, put your reins on. Bring it down, bring it down. Pull the trigger, bang, went old Mildred. It was heaven. Back out, open up again, put the charge in, and then there was a crash like the opening of the gates of hell. And I was thrown about six feet. I picked myself up, and there uh, just wasn't any gun work speaking of left. Up to my feet, round the poop, down the ladder, across the well deck, stepping, stepping on a bloody gruel of men's bodies who'd been smashed as they came out of the poop. Up the ladder, along the upper deck, God, where's the bridge? There isn't any. The captain shouting, abandon ship. The great glaring eye of a searchlight is blazing down on us. I turn to go out. And there on the deck was turning. But it doesn't matter, Mary. There are a lot of people listening to this, and they will remember. When you think of a raft, you nearly always think of the illustration by default of Robinson Crusoe on his raft. You know, a collection of boards tied together with a mast and a sail and a shirt and a couple of packing cases. But that isn't a raft. The raft that we had been on when our ship had been sunk was the size of about six orange boxes, lashed together. Empty oil drums were in the middle, and the sea was like green glass, with beautiful lights of phosphorus underneath. And we went over the side and swam, and there were sharks, and we knew there were sharks. In a crazy hysteria of fear, we crawled under the raft. I remember them so well as they came on. There was Mac, wounded, and Mac David, a second engineer. You know the old story by Kipling that you've only got to go down into the engine room of any ship east of Suez and shout Mac, and someone is bound to come up. 
He was there. The junior Sparks was there. The two little midshipmen were there. I was there, and the extra fort mate and the skipper and the chief engineer. We huddled together there on that raft. And there were shouts and shouts. Let go the painter. She was tied to the boat. She was tied. And the boat was going down. We could see her going down. And suddenly, someone found a knife and slashed and hacked away at the painter. And the raft floated free. And we lay there on the raft, wounded, horribly wounded. And suddenly, without any cause or reason whatsoever, the raft overturned. Just imagine to sit and feel the raft slipping and slipping from underneath you and the water getting close around you and then suddenly the raft has overturned. But we got back. The skipper got back and the chief engineer and they grabbed hold of poor old Mac by the scruff of his neck and dragged him on board and they dragged me on board. And from somewhere or somehow they picked up another boy of the crew and dragged him on board. And we watched our ship sinking. Fortune. I was on the raft and I had been, let us say, so seriously wounded that I was losing consciousness. But I remember two or three things that happened to me. And I don't think I'll ever forget them. The warmth and the security and the infinite love and tenderness which one man, I never know who it was, kept his arm about me the whole time to prevent me from slipping. I remember Mac David the second as he sat on the far end of the raft with that little oar about three foot long, knocking away to scare the sharks. I remember the sharks blue and green and grey as they swept up from the depths of the ocean to make huge, vicious snaps at my legs. I remember the grasping, rasping sound as they scraped along the bottom of the raft, but they didn't get us. And all that night, and all that day, and all the next night. I wonder if you can understand what I mean when I say that. All that night, Twelve hours. And that day, twelve hours. But throughout the whole of that time, the wounded did not complain and the healthy helped. Throughout the whole of that time, the skipper was never referred to as anything else other than sir. There were no complaints. There were no faintings. We stuck it. Holding on. For we knew, we knew that our raft was sinking. Those oil guns had been pierced with machine gun bullets. And then, the smoke on the horizon. And the little midshipman, our first trip midshipman. He stood up on that raft and balanced himself on ten feet by eight of drifting planks and put his coat through his oar and waved it and saved our lives. And I lay there on the raft as the Spanish cramp steamer came alongside and they lowered an enormous great uh, fish basket to put us in. And I saw the basket coming closer and closer and I lifted myself and balanced, balanced on one leg and made a wild grab at the basket as someone suddenly seized me by the seat of the trousers and lifted me inside. <laughs> Just as I left the raft, there was a horrible burning, stinging pain went through my left foot my remaining foot. It wasn't until later that I found out what it was. The sea had made a last bite at me. I'd been stung by a jellyfish. You know, there's always, in some indefinable way, been an antagonism between members of the Navy and the Merchant Service. Because we're both doing the same job, and both do it in an entirely different way. Let me tell you how I last met the Royal Navy. I was on that Spanish tramp, and I was very, very sick indeed. I 
had been three and a half days without any medical attention whatsoever. But that was at the point I was sick. And as I lay in my bunk in the little hospital of this cramp, a man came in and said to me, there's an armed merchant cruiser on the horizon. And I remember I sort of, I sort of passed out after he said that because when I came to, instead of finding my little cabin so calm and so bare, it was full of men, full of sailors. And I remember that I felt as though men were putting binoculars in front of my eyes because one moment everything would be large and the next moment it would recede to a tiny little pinpoint. I was getting delirious, I suppose. And as I lay there, utterly helpless, gazing at them, suddenly they seemed to part and the man pushed his way to the front and he wore the red and gold epaulets of a surgeon in the Royal Navy. And he leaned forward. I'll never forget him. He'd even found out my first name because he got hold of me so gently by the arm and shook me and said, Don't worry, Frank. We're here. We'll look after you. Now, don't worry. We're going to put you to sleep now. And they rubbed my arm with spirit and injected morphia into me. Oh, it was heavenly. All the grinding, searing pain had gone. I felt as if I was floating away on the top of a cloud. And they lifted me and whisked me outside and cut away my clothes and wrapped me in a blanket and carried me in a flexible stretcher and laid me down on the deck just by the gangway, ready to lower me into the boat and safety. And as I laid there on the deck of that steamer, under God's blue sky, and I looked and saw my skipper with the light of hope shining in his eyes, and Mac dreaming away in morphia, laying there beside me, safe, and all the rest of the boys who had been on that raft. And I saw in front of me the huge mass of that armed merchant cruiser, and standing by me, two men, two men in the spotless white of the Royal Navy. Suddenly, something peculiar happened to me, something I had never experienced before in all my life. I had a funny sort of con constricting pain in my chest and a burning sensation in my throat and my eyes. It never happened before. And I didn't know what it was. But I found that I was crying. I was crying. I missed my friends. I missed the men who had helped me. I lay there on the deck of the ship, watched over by the Navy. And I cried in grief and in happiness and in safety.